Some of you, or many of you, actually shared with me your actual sales, which was extremely helpful. We never get that information. We bought data on uh, the, the uh, lifestyle and the habits of people that live and work and vacation and come here for the special events. Uh, we bought data that tells us where they search online, how many seconds they spend looking at a certain product online, uh, what they buy with their credit cards, how much money they earn, and all sorts of really invasive data. And uh, we put those two elements together and have come up with the demand. And in our first draft, we found that the Northside District, uh, uh, if it were operated for best practices, and if retail were operated for, for best practices, could support about 30 to 40 new businesses on the north side and about 15 to 20 new restaurants, uh, totaling over 200,000 square feet. Uh, there's not room for 200,000 square feet, but the market would support it if there were. And it would generate about $80 million a year in additional retail and restaurant sales. The total market for the north end, the people that live, work, shop, and uh, the students and that visit the North End, last year they spent about $1.5 billion on shopping and dining. And we're pretty sure about that number. On the, uh, up at $1.5 billion, the North End is capturing about 3% to 4% of that. About 95% is being spent elsewhere. And uh, we think it's realistic that you could, they could capture another one to one and a half percent of that. That would total uh, about the 75 million. On the south side, we also looked at it and um, we, uh, by the way, in the north end, we found they could support, uh, the bookstore could expand. We found a demand for a gourmet grocer, about 20,000 square foot gourmet grocer for about six to seven apparel clothing stores, two shoe stores, um, cosmetics, bath and body type stores, and a lot of gift stores. On the south side, we found that, uh, we estimate that the people that visit work and the students and people that live, that go into that district, uh, spend about a billion dollars a year last year on dining and shopping. And of that, we think uh, they could capture about 60 million extra. And that would uh, equate to about 25 to 30 new stores and about 10 new restaurants. And uh, the numbers we found here, we also estimated the sales of what those businesses would capture. On average, we're estimating the sales would be about $350 a square foot per year. And you probably all calculate your sales per year uh, and some of you calculate your sales per square foot per year. That's what the industry uses. And if you don't do that, you just take your gross sales and divide it by the sales part of your business, the square footage of your sales. The industry average, the average mall, the malls in this area have sales of about $225 a square foot per year, the average store in our shopping mall. So we think it's the market potential, if best practices were operated, would yield about 50% higher than the industry average. I met some retailers uh, in the area that reported sales of over $500 a square foot per year. I found some retailers that reported sales of under $80 a square foot per year. So there's a very, very big range. And I don't know if you all know Sean. Sean is, works with the city and she is helping uh, attract new businesses and restaurants here. And she goes to the leasing shows and networks with the retailers. If you don't know, Sean, you should know her. This presentation is about the best practices. Um, I, uh, I work in the shopping center industry. Uh, uh, most of our clients are shopping center developers or stores. <coughs> we repositioned uh, for the University of uh, Pennsylvania. We redid 40 at 40th and Walnut Street about 20 years ago and we work for ski resorts, uh, Hilton Head. We did uh, a whole merchandising strategy for Disney, for downtown Disney. It's now called Disney Springs. We did that for all of their properties. And they hire us, firms like that hire us to do market studies and uh, merchandising. The uh, South Arts District is, uh, in my opinion, a really strong up and coming district. 
it's very it's very stable right now but there's still some vacancies and some really some underperforming retailers there but it has the architectural character in the history and a little bit of edginess that most retailers are looking for right now as the shopping mall loses Sears and Penny's and Macy's and as they close the malls those tenants right now are looking for urban real authentic historic towns to go to and so uh, I wouldn't be surprised if any of the malls here close I don't know if any are but if any of them were to close that a lot of those retailers will be seeking to come into the downtown area it has a nice street nice on street parking and uh, really all the universities and all the elements that everybody's looking for right now we also then looked at the North Historic District which is really a nationally known uh, historic place to go and may soon be getting an international uh, recognition as a, a worthy a historical site to go to and uh, it's just really a great place and I'm going to move a little bit so people can see around me um, as a part of this uh, presentation I'm offering all of you uh, two months of free consulting by internet this is my email address and I travel almost every day and get very lonely. And I hope you all send me an email. Please send me photos of your store if you have a particular issue, if you just want an opinion. Uh, please, I welcome you to email me if you have questions and I am very sincere to give free consulting advice. I also run an institute called the Urban Retail Institute. And uh, every day our Facebook group posts research about what's uh, news in urban retail and retail so if you do follow Facebook please uh, join our urban retail Institute there's no charge of course for that uh, the retail industry as you know is in total chaos right now the uh, idea of getting in of putting your family in the car and driving to the mall parking your car walking into the mall going into a store and hoping that they are selling what you want to buy at the right size and the right color and the right brand on sale is a quaint <laughs> idea. And uh, there's whole categories of retail that are leaving. Office supply stores, toy stores, the main commodities that you used to buy in power centers are leaving very rapidly. And uh, because they're just a commodity, it's a transaction to go in and buy uh, paper for your office and it doesn't really have a real experience. Uh, also, uh, it's forecast that within five years, half of all of our grocery shopping will be online. And if that's the case, it could wipe out the most safe category of shopping, neighborhood shopping centers. And it's forecast that more than half of our drugstore shopping will be online. So we're in for a very, very big change. The industry, though, has rules and it has guidelines based on one thing, what the shoppers want. Our entire industry is designed around what people want. If people want to wear uh, one green and one red shoe, then our job is to supply them one green and one red shoe and not to sell brown shoes that we personally like. Everything is geared around the shopper. And I'm gonna just outline some of those principles for you. Uh, first of all, in America, we're over retail. We have 20, now 22 square feet of retail per person. Uh, this Lehigh Valley, we think has about 40 square feet of retail per person compared to the rest of the world. We are significantly over retail in this country. The other challenge is that in America, only 4% of the budget goes for apparel and only 5% goes for dining out and entertainment. This 4% has dropped. It used to be 12% in the 1950s. And a recent study showed that the average American person can go four years without buying any more clothes. Our closets are overpacked. So uh, we are oversupplied with merchandise generally. To get around that, the uh, shopping center industry comes up with gimmicks to get you to buy things. Uh, my son uh, goes to school in Scotland and uh, he's become very well groomed now. He gets a haircut every week. 
and uh, gets a shave every day. And this is why, when I went there, I found out why. Uh, it's a free shot. And uh, the industry has been like that since uh, the Roman days. You have to have a reason to get people a shot. People have to go to work, they have to go to school, they have to take their children to somewhere, but they don't have to shop. Shopping is almost always an elective activity except for groceries. And your job is to motivate, to come up with that must reason why you have to shop. The new job post the internet is you have to come up with an experience to make it worth going into your store or going into your downtown district. Uh, the, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, gimmicks on Cape Cod. This town painted, the store owner painted the sidewalks to go directly to the front of his door. <laughs> so when you cross the street, you have a sudden urge to buy a gift. Uh, the new gimmick for uh, last year that they're experimenting with for this year, the new gimmick is what they call vanity sizing. Uh, in order to get women to buy clothes that they don't need, uh, they changed all the sizes. They cut out the labels and they put in one size smaller. So if, you, if last year you were a size six, this year you're gonna be a size four. And same outfit. And what they found is that when women find they can fit into a size four or a size two, or they even now have a size negative two, if you can fit into a smaller size, they give away their entire wardrobe to Goodwill and they buy a whole new wardrobe to reward how much uh, they've lost. So I think that's the low point of the profession. Um, this is the vanity sizing, which is really a low point, but it's really working well. Um, internet sales are 8% of overall sales. They're now 9% since this was taken but still 91 cents of every dollar is actually being spent in a real store. Uh, this is a misleading number because for things you can buy in a mall, uh, the internet are 40% of the sales. So clothing, books, electronics, things like that are 40%. So you have a formidable uh, competition. What I've observed about the South District and the North District at some point is that they are not shopping districts. They are a collection of really great restaurants and shops that people are driving to, going shopping, and then going home. And that means that you have to work really hard. You have to get every customer to be a purpose-driven reason to go to your store. Eventually, I think with the city's help and with other help, you can become a district where people will drive, to Third Street or they'll drive to Main Street, park the car, and spend an hour or so walking around to a variety of shops. It's only a matter of time, I'm sure, before that's going to happen to the South District. A lot has happened in the last few years, but there's a ways to go. Malls, uh, it's forecast that 25% of the malls are going to close in this country in the next two years. And so this was published four years ago. And already 12% of the malls have closed in the last two years. Because of that, the malls are losing tenants so rapidly that they are now painting the stores white and they're putting electric signs so that every month they can put in a new tenant. Okay, They're not even doing the full build-outs anymore. This is the new thing. They're also taking stores that just sell online, that don't have a real store, and putting those stores in the mall and not charging them a base rent. They're charging them a percentage of the increase of their online sales in that region. It's really brilliant. And then after a while, if they do well, they'll open a real store. The new shopping centers being built today, and you have one here in the region, are being built as they're known as town centers or lifestyle centers and they are really fake type towns they build them two stories tall the upper story is fake they build them out of brick the architects actually go to small towns and photograph and measure the buildings and recreate them to look like real towns this is being done because these translate to higher sales than the malls and uh, 
I helped invent this category about 20 years ago. They're now, we used to call them town centers. They're now called open air centers because town scares the shopping center developers. But we put in streets. We always put in parallel parking because it's more beautiful than diagonal parking, even though nobody can parallel park. We put in parking meters and sidewalks and we actually work very hard to make them look like real towns. And these centers outperform malls. They do very, very, by outperforming, I mean they have higher sales. We also, though, put in the, tent, the stores that people like to shop at. And we actually find out what brands and what stores people want, and we put them in the centers. We spend a lot of money on the public realm. This is an exact copy of a Paris park in Paris, France. This is the exact same crushed stone. They imported it from France. And everything is built to give it a very interesting public realm. Even the parking lots and parking garages are finished to a high standard. This is a parking garage. This is the lobby to the parking garage. They use real stone floors, real stone on the walls, real drywall. They have leather seating. And the parking garages are built to a very high standard. They're well lit, they have high ceilings, and they are sparkling clean. And they're managed well. We don't allow any parking on the first two floors until 10 a.m. That keeps the uh, workers from taking the primary spots. And uh, they're either completely free or the first two hours are free. And that's a really great method of getting people to shop if they can just pull into the garage for two hours free. We spend a ton of money on detail. These are benches for children. These are benches for adults. Even the bathroom fixtures are sized for children. We really want the shopper to feel like they're getting special attention. This is Alexandria, Virginia, uh, an, an historic town we've been working on for uh, quite a while. And the retailers, if they don't go into the town centers, they actually now are preferring to go into historic city, cities like this. The best retailers in the country, when they leave the mall, first try to find a downtown district to go to if the downtown district has high design standards, if the storefronts have to be designed to a high standard, not necessarily traditional or historic, but they want them designed to a nice standard, they, re they want cities that have really strict sign codes, and they want cities that are planned, that are managed with the Downtown Development Authority. They want cities in which the property owners put into a fund and a professional group manages the marketing and advertising and cleanliness and snow plowing of the downtown. Those are called DDD, DDA authorities. The better retailers will not come to a downtown that doesn't have a formal downtown development authority. If they can't find that, then they go to, we go to malls, and we go to the town centers. Historically, American cities had all retail. Historically, they, their main streets had 30 to 40,000 cars per day. This is Bay City, Michigan in 1942. They had 40,000 cars per day. They had all the national chains this is Cressy, this is uh, the forerunner of Kmart. This was a, a five and dime store, we call dollar store today. They had dollar stores, they had massive department stores, they had Sears and Pennies, and they had grocery stores and furniture stores, and even car dealers. Downtowns in their heyday sold everything you could buy, and they had about 75 to 80% of the market share in the county. Right now, downtown, uh, the north and south side in Bethlehem have somewhere between one and 5%, which is average. In the 1950s, when the downtowns were at their peak, when they had 80% of the market share, they were ugly. <laughs> this is a typical downtown. They did not have sign ordinances. They did not have historic codes. They had too much traffic. But up until about 1962, the downtowns were the place to go. 
uh, in downtown Detroit, we had a department store called Hudson's, and it was 2 million square feet. This, it was just shy of Macy's in New York by about 50,000 feet. This was common. In Philadelphia, you had Wanamaker's, which was about a million and a half square feet in its day. This size is, this is the size, well, they had beautiful interiors, and this size would represent today 15 super Walmarts. The average department store Wanamaker's would be 10 Walmart stores if it were built today, one per floor. Downtowns had big box retailers in their heyday. They were loved. Department stores sponsored the Christmas parade and people loved and people still remember the department stores. You probably all went to Wanamaker's at one time. Uh, they did charge full price. They only had one or two sales a year and they paid low wages. They paid 35 to 50 cents an hour. But people still loved them because they were good to the city and they were huge. In Missoula, Montana, uh, in 1960, the downtown had 70% of the market share. Today, uh, it only has 3% of the market share. In Europe, the cities still thrive in part because they still have their department stores. This is a million and a half square foot department store in Amsterdam. The cities thrive because of that. This is the inside of the department store. The downtowns died very quickly when they lost the department stores because the department stores bring about 30 to 40% of all customers to a mall or to a downtown. And when the, depart when the department stores leave the malls, they will almost all close. And the downtowns really went into a tailspin when that happened. In my own town in Birmingham, Michigan, when we lost our department stores, the merchants on average sales dropped 30%. Uh, today, most downtowns have below 10% market share, and the suburbs have 70 to 80% of the market share, and that's the case here. Your suburbs have about 90 to 95% of the market share. Um, we are part of a movement called the New Urbanism Movement, and our goal is to save farmland by having people live in cities like they did in Europe. We feel that by having more people live in a city, it's more sustainable to the environment. And so we advocate having higher densities in downtowns rather than having people live on quarter acre lots out on the farms. I understand that there, it is very hard to develop in parts of the South District and that there's almost always challenges. We have been told that there are lots of real estate developers that want to build housing in the South District, but that it's always a major battle and they're afraid they're going to lose. And it's much easier to build in the suburbs. The average, depart the average store target should be to have $350 a square foot per year. That's considered what's necessary if you are going to be able to pay your rent pay your labor, buy your merchandise, and pay yourself a, a good wage. That's the target, 350 per square foot per year. We think that downtowns should strive to have 20% market share, and wherever we work in a city, we our job is to raise you to 20%. I would like to see Bethlehem's downtown, the south and north, capture 20% market share. In our market study, we're assuming that you grow from three or four or five percent to six to eight percent. We're being very conservative in our analysis. The uh, average mall owned by this company, which just sold, has sales of $1,000 a square foot per year. I'm a landscape architect. I worked as an urban planner for quite a while, and I was retained by Taubman to help them build city malls. We built one in Cherry Creek in Denver and Columbus. We built them around the country. And uh, Taubman taught me the science of retailing. And I got to go through the building department, the leasing department, the visual merchandising department. That's where I learned the science of, of merchandising because at Taubman, we would study how people walked with cameras. And we would design the mall to keep them in the mall longer. And we 
I know how to make you turn right or turn left in a mall, and I know how to make you slow down or go fast. We use all sorts of really subtle tricks to control you, and because of that, Taubman's malls have the highest sales per square foot in the country, and they just sold. They have the 25 highest producing malls in the country. Department stores increased sales by about 33%. Grocery stores increased sales by 25%. You have a great grocery store in the South District Seatown. Uh, I don't know if that's benefiting you by 25%, but on average, a grocery store increases sales by 25%. We found a demand for Seatown to expand. We also found a demand for a small grocer on the north side, and we found a demand for gourmet specialty food like cheese shops, wine shops, poultry, bakeries, <coughs> uh, things of that nature. If you can't get a grocer in your downtown, you can get a public market like the Pike Street Market. I know there's plans to build one here. Uh, if it were built right on, on uh, 3rd Street, where you could walk out of the market and right to the downtown, it would increase sales by about 20 to 30%. Where it's located, we'll still have an upside. It will bring a lot of people there. Uh, restaurants increase sales by only 5%. People that go to restaurants tend to stay there a long time and it tends not to translate to retail sales. Although we like restaurants because restaurants help us get better tenants. <coughs> restaurants increase retail rents though by 50%. Restaurants can pay more than retailers. And so if you get a lot of restaurants, the downside is they tend to inflate the rents. Festivals, and you have some great festivals here, festivals increase restaurant sales by 35% on average. But uh, parks increase restaurant sa uh, retail sales only by 5% on average, but they're necessary. Festivals, special festivals, tend to decrease retail sales by 10% that day. Your, your festivals, I think, are a little different. I know the Christmas festival you have increases retail sales. A number of retailers told me that 40 to 60% of their sales come from that uh, holiday event you have on the north side. But generally, art fairs and festivals generally will be the worst sales day for retailers. Restaurants can increase retails by 10% if you have the right type of restaurant. Cinemas increase retail sales by 6%, restaurant sales by 40%. These are just some cities that we've just recently been working in. I don't know why I put those in there, sorry. Um, we've been working in the Hamptons very recently, and this is a pretty good model for a historic town. It's very expensive. It's an expensive place to live, but the storefronts are actually quite simple. They have good signage codes and stuff, but they're actually just painted well and easy to maintain. We just finished an assignment in South Memphis. South Memphis is a very poor area where the incomes are right around the poverty level. And this was their only grocery store, and this is their only uh, <coughs> restaurant. And our job was to help them bring in a grocery store into the area, 30,000 people uh, with no restaurant or food. We uh, invented this little idea, these little pop-up sheds. This is one we did in Northern Michigan where you just put in these little tiny little sheds and you can grow your own retail. It's something that you may want to consider doing in the North or South District. They're especially good during festivals. Uh, we're rec gonna recommend that you put in uh, wayfinding signage that indicates where the stores are. There are a lot of businesses, we estimate, I think we estimated around 200 million, 150 or 200 million in tourist sales potential. And so we're recommending that you put a place saying, you are here, here's all the restaurants, here's all the shops. I think you would find an increase in traffic. A lot of our customers lately have been mall developers that built shopping centers that are empty. This is one we're working on in Maryland this has been empty for 12 years. It's been vacant for 12 years. And this is one we're working on in Utah. This has been vacant for nine years. The developer built 200,000 square feet and he has no tenants. And this happens a lot because they break the cardinal rules. This happened because they didn't 
make this space big enough for a grocery store. Grocery store went across the street and all the tenants went there. A lot of the shopping centers we work for look like this and uh, they want us to tell them why upper end shoppers won't go there. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we just get into the basics of how your windows are displayed and the management and such. This uh, shopping center, we worked for this restaurant, they wanted to know why nobody could find the front door of the restaurant. And so we told them easily, just lock the front door. This shopping center developer wanted to know why nobody knew that those were retail shops. So what do you think we told them? Signs, right? Uh, again, the average mall does about 275 to 280 a square foot per year. Most of the small retailers that we advise only do about 80 to $90 a square foot per year. A lot of the businesses that we met here have sales of under 100 square feet, but some have sales of three or 400 a square foot. At $85 a square foot, you're probably not paying yourself minimum wage. It's a real hardship. The goal again is to have sales of 350 a square foot per year. That equates to $1,000 a day if you have a 1,000 square foot store. That's a very big number. It takes a lot of foot traffic to do $1,000 a square foot per year. Well, that can include your online sales, but that really should be your target goal. When we advise stores, we try to bring them up to that level. Uh, a lot of stores and malls like uh, Bath & Body might do $650 or $700 a square foot per year. Uh, Kaufman does a thousand. Uh, the outlet malls do about two to three thousand a square foot per year. And uh, that's because tourists love going to outlet malls. Tourists like buying brands they know from company stores. Their heads explode when they go to outlet malls because they, can, they think they can buy all the best brands at low prices. As you know, these, these mer this merchandise is different than the full price stores but the tourists uh, like to believe it's not. The average Apple store does $5,000 a square foot per year. These sales are so high for Apple stores that you can't, if you own a mall with an Apple store, you, you have to pull their sales out of your average when you report your sales to Wall Street. Uh, the Apple store in New York does $66,000 a square foot per year. That's the highest store in the world. And uh, that's in a basement with no windows. Uh, so the averages, 1,000 for Taubman. Resorts tend to do 850 a square foot per year. The average for malls, 80. Our goal when we work with retailers is to get you up to 275 to 230 to 350 a square foot per year. Now back in the 80s, if you're old enough, you remember the group called the Yuppies. Yuppies love to buy name brands they like to wear the brands really big, and they like to overpay for everything. So yuppies like paying $200 for Calvin Klein jeans if the logo was really big on the pocket. And they would brag to all their friends that they're wearing $200 jeans and they're wearing $200 Gucci shoes, and you know they like to overpay for everything. Uh, back when I worked in the mall industry, this was our customer. It was almost always a woman, 75 to 80% of our customers were women, and they did not have jobs. They had a husband who made a good living, and their primary social activity was going to the mall. And they would go to the mall three to four times per month with their girlfriends, and they would get completely dressed up. They would have their hair done, their nails done, put on all their best jewelry, and they would go to the mall for three hours, three to three and a half hours, and they would go to almost every store. And that was, besides playing bridge or uh, tennis, it was their number one social thing to do. And this was a social activity, believe it or not, back in the 90s. Uh, families today are almost always having two incomes, and they're working long hours, and they tend to be underpaid, and they're very stressed for money. So the families today don't see shopping as something for fun. It's something they have to do, except when they're on vacation. So they shop together maybe for groceries, but they're not going out and just spending hours and hours in the mall anymore. 
the senior crowd uh, are living longer and they're very afraid they're gonna outlive their money. So seniors have stopped spending. And uh, we found on North End that a lot of the visitors are senior age. And it would be good if we could lower the age of that a little bit. Seniors uh, do other things besides shop. And when they do shop, they like to go to dinner at 4.30 and get a blue plate special. Uh, millennials are very cheap, unlike yuppies. Uh, millennials like to sit in coffee shops for three or four hours and use the internet for free and sit on the bench and have a, a, a cup of coffee. They, they have nothing, that doesn't bother them at all. Millennials will go into a shoe store and try on a pair of shoes and if they like it, they'll take a picture of it right in front of the store owner and they'll look it up online and order it from Zappos right in front of the store owner. They, they, it doesn't bother them at all. And yuppies tend to uh, want to spend their money on experiences rather than material things. So yeah, they will buy millennials. Yeah, what they're saying. <laughs> yeah, oh, excuse me, millennials. Millennials uh, actually like to uh, brag that they are they don't are they're not buying expensive things. This is a, a new pair of jeans that woman just bought, and the hot thing is to look like you are not spending money on material things that you're spending money uh, doing things. And so uh, they're not being really good customers. They're happy to shop at H&M and to pay $12.95 for that dress. And even though it will fall apart after the third washing, uh, they're okay with that. This is a complete paradigm and this is a disaster for retailers. We've lost the generations that like to spend money. Because of that, we're trying to give the millennials experiences. They like hanging out in alleys and edgy places. They like urbanism. They want an experience and they will spend money if you give them an experience. So the way that we're finding we can compete with the internet is by giving them an interesting experience. Millennials like uh, to sit in chairs this is the way we're doing seat uh, 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 benches now in our town centers. They have to be unscrewed to the floor because they have their own individual way of doing things and they like to tilt the chair about an inch. It makes them feel like they're an individual. And they have to have cushions because they've been spoiled their whole life. And they like to just sit there and talk for hours and maybe get a cup of coffee. So we are designing our town centers around millennials and begging that they'll spend money. Uh, this is a new restaurant that was designed to look grungy to make the millennials feel comfortable. They don't like places that we liked. They want places that are a little edgy where maybe you know they'll see somebody a little different than them. And they like eating outside facing the sidewalk. This is Rittenhouse Square. They like facing the sidewalk and they like being around people. They want to be around people in edgy places. So the new shopping malls that are being built today are being built to emulate edgy places. We're making some buildings deliberately a little ugly and we're you know, breaking a little bit of the sidewalks here and there. Urban Outfitters likes to break their windows a little bit. And we're trying to create places that are attractive to them because once they buy into a brand like Patagonia, they will be that customer for life. This is a town center that we designed in the 80s for yuppies and uh, the millennials can't stand it. It's too nice. Uh, this is a typical park. This is a beautiful town center in Atlanta called Avalon. Has a great park. They bring a lot of special events. Uh, but during the special events, the retail sales go down. Because people that go to free events tend to be really cheap. And they don't tend to do a lot of shopping. But they will go to eating out. This is Avalon. Walkability is really important for retailers and real estate developers. There's a service called the Walk Score, and it measures every square foot in the US on your cell phone. You can look at the Walk Score. And the retailers today 
and the real estate investors want a walk score of 80 or higher. I don't know what the walk score is for either district. I should have looked that up. Probably they're pretty high. They're high. They're, probably, they're north of 80. Yeah. So the real estate investors like areas with high walk scores, and that means you can walk to a grocery store, a coffee shop, a library, restaurants, public transportation. This is where Wall Street is investing money today. They like areas that have storefronts and that are interesting to look at. This is my hometown, Birmingham, Michigan. We have 20,000 people and we have 7 million square feet of commercial. We're a suburb of Detroit and our trade area is really all 5 million people in Detroit. It has really great urbanism. They have a downtown development authority which manages the city really well. We have a walk score 92. The retailers and the millennials right now are all looking for what we call the X factor. And that is when you have a built environment that you fall in love with, that you get an emotional connection to. So we all, this is a new store. We hire artists to do the stores to make a, 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 uh, an emotional connection. This is a coffee shop and it's designed to look like it was designed like it was by an artist. This is uh, on Spruce Street in Philadelphia. My son lives in Rittenhouse Square now. Uh, we're putting in, this is new, but in our centers, we're putting in retro neon signs and we're trying to make them feel uh, retro. We're making storefronts that are beautifully landscaped. There's a study that shows when people see ivy or green or plants, uh, they will uh, feel uh, what we call price elasticity, which means they feel comfortable spending up to 12% more for the same item in this store than in a discount store because they feel like they're getting better value and they're better relaxed. This is a very simple thing you can do is to put flower boxes in front of your store. In cities that have a downtown development authority, the DDA actually puts the flower boxes all along and maintains them. Uh, everybody likes the local independent retailer like John Cross, the fish market. This helps it feel like it's an authentic place. This is a new town center that lacks the X factor. This looks like it's just a commercial asset on somebody's spreadsheet and that's what it is. Nobody will ever fall in love with this place. All the storefronts are designed with shopping center aluminum storefronts and tented glass, and they all have the same boring awnings. This, is a, this, this sort of center will lead to low sales, and this sort of center will not be able to compete with the internet. And one of the uh, challenges that I've seen here is that a lot of the new retailer buildings that are being built are being built like suburban strip centers in the storefronts, and they're lacking that X factor. Uh, we were working on this in Brooklyn, where the developer is bringing in shipping containers and incubating our own little tenants. And uh, the tenants only have to sign a 30-day lease. And every once in a while, one of those 30-day tenants becomes a full two, three-year lease. And this is something that I think you could do on the south side, is incubate some edgy tenants here. Uh, this sort of storefront connects well, or this sort of restaurant connects well. Uh, it's well cared for and it makes people feel like they're getting better value. These are the little pop-up sheds that we did in Northern Michigan and little things like flower boxes and attention to detail and signage makes people feel like the item they buy in that place is different or better quality than they can get online and you can outcompete the internet with little things like that. Just little things like planters and flowers can make a very big difference. And generally, I haven't seen that here in either district. I think there's room for more landscaping and more love. It's a lot easier if you have a downtown development authority paying for this and maintaining them. Our DDA pays for about 1,200 planters in the downtown. By the way, these tend to get, in university towns, these tend to get vandalized every night. And this is a university place, and every night, students or somebody knocks these over and throws out the plant. Mm -hmm. And the uh, retailer says, I'm going to fight back. They hired a landscaper to come in every morning and stand it up, clean it, and replant it. And they refuse to give in. 
And this look makes the district feel safer. It makes it feel like somebody cares. And I think there is room for improvement of that on the south side. I think there are signs, are, like your trees are branched too low. The lighting is weak. There's subtle signs that maybe make it feel like it's not as safe as it is. Civic art is extremely important. This is Naples, Florida. We're working in Naples, Florida right now. Uh, civic art uh, really helps restaurant, retail sales, book sales, and it helps increase the experience. A lot of cities are uh, returning back to really uh, traditional holiday lighting with real evergreens and real garland to add to the authenticity. This is a new storefront that's all glass block. This is an extremely expensive store, but it's designed, you know, really to a very high standard. Uh, this is the new Starbucks. This is a national chain that's coming to America. They are hoping to have more of these than there are Starbucks. It's, the, it's out of England, and it's designed to look like it's not a national chain. You'll see these all over. The interior is very grungy, not to look like a national chain. If you could have civic art, and there is a lot of civic art on the south side, and there's some on the north side, but I think there's room for more. This is a project we're working on in Mexico, and they, the uh, developer actually built the podiums and lighting, and then they invite artists to display their work, and then they give a prize for the favorite piece of work. And there are beautiful murals already here, but these really help distinguish you as an exciting place to go. This is an interesting mural where uh, this gives you the experience that you can't necessarily get online. Uh, we've been working in Sioux Falls, and uh, again, they have pedestals all up and down the main street. They invite artists in, and then they give a $50,000 prize to the people's favorite art. This would be something that could really help. This drives hundreds of thousands of people to Sioux Falls to see the art. Signage. It, it is important for your branding, but also to represent that you're offering experience and equality. This is a little store in uh, Missoula that we've been working for. Uh, the only challenge, problem I have with this is that nobody knows what five on black means. And it's a, a restaurant that specializes in tea. But the sign doesn't reinforce that, even though it's a beautiful sign. It's important to have handcrafted Signs. We like to see A-frame signs. A-frame signs can increase your traffic significantly. I don't know if they're legal here or not, but if they are, they should really be handcrafted. And then the signs themselves on the buildings should be individual type letters that are pulled a little away from the building to make your store look like you're not a big chain, that you're more of a handcrafted image. A lot of cities now are asking or giving a bonus if you develop a three-dimensional sign to make uh, it look more interesting. This is a neat little sign. This is all steel. And this store owner had a local artist design a sign that said we want an exciting sign. So this helps reinforce the fact that you're buying something, you're buying an experience here. Best practices. Uh, last year, 75% of all retail sales occurred after five o'clock at night in the United States. Uh, and uh, if you do close after five o'clock at night, you're generally giving up 75% of the market share. That being said, it is impossible if you're a small business or a single owner to have night hours. I acknowledge that. So you just have to work harder than, than those hours. But you should realize that uh, you're giving up 75% of the market share. Uh, parking is the most single important thing that you can do. Um, to bring customers in. Uh, ideally, customers driving by will see a place to park, they'll see something they wanna buy, see a place to park and be able to go in. Generally, if they can't park where they can see the front of the store from the car, they will think parking is, is, um, is uh, too short. They will think that there's not enough parking. The general customer today wants to see the front of the store from their car because they want to know who is between them and their destination. They want to scope it out. If you, uh, if there is no parking in front of your, on your block, most customers will not go around the block two or three times looking for a space they'll go home. 
we estimate that every parking space that's metered turns over about 10 times per day. If it turns 10 times per day, it'll produce about $175,000 a year in retail sales, sometimes 200,000. So there are meters here. I think there's room for improvement in the Southside's parking management system. Um, and I'm not even sure you need any meters right now, but at some time you definitely will. We find that when there are not meters, that the store owner tends to park in front of their store uh, for 10 to 12 hours a day. That's just human nature. This is a town in Cape Cod. This is the store owner of that store, and that's the store owner of that store, and the uh, merchants park in front of their store for eight to 10 hours a day, uh, or the residents or office workers park in front of the stores. And this uh, group of merchants hired us because they said there's no parking downtown and they wanted to know what we could do to make the, uh, make for the city to build a parking garage for them. Well, there's two issues with that. The, a lot of shoppers don't want parking garages and they really shouldn't park in front of their space. If you ever uh, change your meter system, we recommend against a kiosk uh, but to keep meters, I think one of your parking lots has kiosks, and I have a video of people trying to use the kiosk. <laughs> uh, these uh, kiosks require that you can read and follow directions, and that's above the uh, ability of most shoppers. Um, and they also take a lot of time, because you have to park, go back, write down your license plate, go back to the car, and then go back and forth. And so you lose a lot of time. In the new centers we build, we are always building parking meters, but giving free parking in the garages for two hours. So it's a choice. You can have free parking and walk a block, or you can pay 50 cents and go right into the store. Your choice. Visual merchandising. Uh, that's the science of getting people's attention to look at your store, to look at your storefront. It's the science of displaying what's inside your store to have people stay longer and to pick up things and to look at buying what they're looking at. As a rule of thumb, the color of red increases retail sales. There's research that shows red, the color of red causes a chemical reaction in your brain that actually excites you and motivates and makes you want to buy something. So you will see a lot of red uh, in stores. Blue does the opposite. Blue calms you down, blue curbs your appetite, and it tends to make you not want to eat or buy anything. You'll see the front and center table. The front and center table is front and center. Its job is to bring you into the store. The national chains expect 20 to 30% of every daily sales to come from items on the front and center table. They change them every week. Uh, Barnes & Noble now celebrates 52 holidays a year. They just made up a lot of them. And uh, they display the holiday, you know, like opening a fly fishing season or whatever on their front and center table. It's important to have coarsely green merchandise, large merchandise on the back walls so that you can pull people into the store. There's a rule called the eight second rule. It takes eight seconds to walk past most storefronts. You reach the door in about four seconds, and you only have about a second to two seconds to read the window display uh, and to get excited to go into the store. And so your window displays have to be able to be totally comprehended in about a second. If you put too much in your window, then uh, they may just shut down and get overwhelmed and not go into the store. If the door of your store is open, generally you will get 25 to 35% more foot traffic in your store if the door is open. Now, I know that's impossible when it's extremely hot or extremely cold, but it generates a lot of traffic. If you have two doors and you're too lazy to unlock both doors because you have to bend over, and a customer pulls on a locked door, they will be so humiliated that when they go into your store, they will not buy anything. This is a hard fact. It's very important if you have two doors 
just keep it. Have you ever pulled on a locked door? Do you feel humiliated? The merchandising is being done today now either on white or black shelving and everything is being arranged to make it look like it's in your grandmother's farmhouse to make you have this affiliation with some family member that you love and very often they will display things that they don't even sell uh, just to be a lifestyle prop. The national chains have found that by putting large oversized posters of beautiful people in the window, even if they're wearing things they don't sell, have people look at their storefront a lot longer and increases traffic by sometimes 15%. If you have an opportunity to buy some, it could be a farmhouse, it could be a, a wood scene, some large poster, doesn't have to have people in it, will have people look towards your window and give you more traffic. Once inside the store, it's important to pre-sort and to do shopping for your customers. So this uh, person did not pre-sort. And when you look at this for a second or two, you're likely to shut down and you're not able to understand what they're trying to say in this message. There's too many things to look at. There's something called a buy zone, which is between two and five feet off the ground. Anything below two feet uh, will never sell. Those shoes should not be there. We do work with a lot of retailers. We go in one-on-one, -on -one, usually in shopping malls, but sometimes in cities, to help them increase their sales. This is a, a, a guy named Andy, and we were hired by the city of Baltimore because they were widening the sidewalk, getting rid of all the on-street parking, shutting the street down for 12 months, and all the retailers along there said, I'm leaving, and they're all closing. And our job was to help some of them stay. Andy had decided, he had given this notice before, he was leaving because the city planning department wouldn't let him put up any more open signs in his window. He thought he needed a one more open sign in order to get people to go into his store. So this is where he was pointing where he wanted the sign, and the city planning department wouldn't allow any more open signs, and he said, because of the city planning department, I'm going out of business and I'm closing. So we were asked to help Andy with the store, and uh, we took, went across the street, looked at the store for Andy, and said, uh, first of all, Andy, have you ever looked at your store across the street? And he said, no, I come and go out of the back. And so we looked at it and we said, Andy, these are the challenges to your store. <laughs> You have stacked chairs in the corner. His problem, by the way, he said, my main problem is that people stop coming into my store at one o'clock in the afternoon. He said, I have a really busy uh, time between 10 and 12.30. At one o'clock, nobody comes into my store. So we thought about it and we said, well, these stacked chairs make it look like you're closed. These dead flowers are not very appealing. Uh, he had a dead mouse in the window, so that's not very appealing. His door was falling off the hinges. He had glass held up by duct tape. And um, we also said, what do you do at 12.30? And he said, well, at 12.30, the sun comes over to the window, and I had this Pepsi cooler, and the sun makes it overheat, and it runs all the time, and it, it blows the circuit at my store. So I have to close the blinds at 12.30, and I close my door, and uh, that keeps the Pepsi machine cool. Well, he had never made the correlation between closing his blinds at 12.30 and nobody coming into the store at 12.31. And so we pointed that out to him. We also pointed out these things to Andy and uh, really helped his store for about a $100 budget. We planted flowers, we cleaned the windows, we got rid of the dead mouse, we, uh, we uh, had him put a sign. He didn't have a sign. Can you guess what Andy sells? He's a deli operator. And he said, well, I don't need a sign because every, I've been here uh, for 20 years. Everybody knows I'm here. Well, we found in the research that his neighborhood was turning over every five years. People, 20% were moving out of the neighborhood. So we had him do all that. And then we had him put uh, little French tables in the front, painting them a bright red. Um, and we had him do the old restaurant trick. The old restaurant trick is Nobody likes to go into a restaurant that's empty. You, you, either it's, they have bad food or you're gonna feel like a loser eating all by yourself in a restaurant. 
So the old trick in a restaurant is you put, you fill the front tables first, you keep the window clear, you don't put up curtains, and you want to put all the people in the window, and you put all of the really good looking people in the window. The uh, less good looking people you put in the back where nobody can see them. <laughs> That's the oldest trick in the business, so uh, you'll know how you fit. I always get stuck in the kitchen <laughs> where nobody can see me. But we were able to double Andy's sales for $100, just from a few basics like that. And that level of tactical repairs can be done where you can see an increase in traffic. You probably won't double your sales, but you can do a lot. The national chains think this through. They hire merchandising experts, the national chains found that in North America, 90% of the people, nine out of 10 people, turn right when they go into your store. They like to walk counterclockwise. In Australia, they turn left, by the way. But here they turn right. They like to walk counterclockwise. They like to touch merchandise that's folded. They'll be more likely to pick it up if it's folded than if it's on a hanger. If it's on a hanger, they will think it's discount cheap merchandise like they can buy at a discount store. They feel this is higher quality than something on a hanger. They even stack the merchandise with the big size on top and the small size on the bottom. They sell more big sizes when the big size is on top. And then they know that people walk counterclockwise. They know that a research shows that when you paint the back of the store a bright color, that you will get about 30 to 50% more traffic to the back of the store. So they'll always paint the back of the store a bright color. If there is a uh, skylight in the store, it'll increase sales automatically by 10 to 12%. You can tell every Walmart in the country with Google Earth, it's the one with skylights every 30 feet in the roof. They do that because it helps sales. It also saves energy for them. This is the buy zone, between two and five, five and a half feet off the ground. This is the front and center table. Uh, this retailer, by the way, uh, had nothing there on the front and center table except this poster. And when I asked her why, she said, well, every time I put shoes there, they sell so fast that I can't keep them in stock. <laughs> so I, don't, I can't put shoes there. So, you know, what are you gonna do? Uh, this is a nice little front and center table for a local, local independent retailer. It has a little lifestyle basket, something on a mannequin, and uh, something on sale. Here's a retailer uh, that we worked with in, this, in South Carolina uh, that was really struggling. That's the owner of the store. And he said, Bob, my problem is I get a lot of traffic into the store, but they all stop right here and nobody goes past this point. Can you tell me why nobody goes past that point? So it's pretty obvious, isn't it? The point was about this wide. And that's the cash register. So if one person is buying something, he completely seal off the store. Just a very simple thing. He also had too many things on the ground and he had a uh, a single aisle going through the middle of the store. Uh, a lot of people don't like to walk past the same merchandise twice. They like to walk in a circle. So uh, we had to rearrange it so you didn't have to walk back past the merchandise twice. This is very typical of what we see in small towns. This is not uh, in the North or South District, but it could be. There are a number of restaurants that are, the front door is actually a biohazard. I think it should be regulated because you can see bacteria crawling on the door. A number of your storefronts are quite bad. These doors should be painted as much as often, even if it's every month. Uh, Jimmy John's, and that, you have Jimmy John's here? Jimmy John's is a subway chain. They require all glass surfaces to be washed five times a day in the Jimmy John's. Uh, the better retailers tend not to allow handwritten posters, they tend to hide the tape, and then they tend to organize the posters in a with a in an orderly way so that they're not distracting. This tells people going into this restaurant, even if though it's really good food, 
that it's probably not really good food and this turns off a lot of customers. A lot of businesses I saw in this area have this sort of character. The basic science of, of store design is uh, people come and see the front and center table and this is called the decompression zone. For the first two steps, people will be a little bit confused because of the difference of light and sound. So we put no merchandise in the decompression zone. We expect them to turn right into the store. We put the merchandise around the outside of the store. The theory is to have the customer walk counterclockwise to the outer edge of the store as much as possible. And then we put the, the highest profit margin merchandise in the middle so that the people have to walk past the merchandise two to three times. The cash registers are always put on the right of the store in North America to take advantage of this circulation and uh, to have them walk back past the high profit merchandise. This is a very simple diagram. This is generally how all uh, retailers lay out their store. Uh, here, the decompression zone, sorry, the decompression zone was how many feet that? It's two steps. It's usually about five to six feet. A lot of the stores here, and this is common, will put a lot of stuff in the front. Holiday cards and all sorts of things in the front. That more confuses the customer and it's hard to sell things in the front and center table. You really want that decompression zone. Uh, again, here's the front and center table. This is designed to walk counterclockwise to go right. Here's a classic, uh, this is Vineyard Vines, this is a national chain. Every Vineyard Vines look like this this week. They change the front and center table in Vineyard Vines every 10 days or so. Uh, these are lifestyle props. They don't sell lobster traps, but that relaxes you to feel comfortable. By the way, I recommend you sell your lifestyle props. And you should sell, find some interesting antique things and put a, put a price on them and sell them. And you can do pretty well with those. Use them as a display and sell them. Here they're expecting you to turn right. And this uh, is the greatest invention of all time, the sale. Uh, customers today, unlike our parents, expect to see at least five things on sale in your store as soon as they walk into the store and they expect the items to be good items, not things you couldn't sell last year, and they expect them to be displayed like the good merchandise and to be spread around the store, not on a broken down sales rack in the back corner. They want to have dignity buying something on sale. So the first thing your customer should see going into a store is something on sale in your front and center table, and then you should have in season good stuff on sale. It doesn't have to be much, it can be as little as 15% off, but it makes them feel like they're getting better value and it makes them feel like everything they're buying is sort of value. This is a classic little front and center display. They're using a poster they got from the supplier. There's a lifestyle prop of gloves. This is kind of a rustic table. These are old cast iron pipes turning the, into hangers. Millennials love that. They cannot stand buying things on chrome racks. That's what their grandmother shopped at, and that's what's at Walmart. Nothing against Walmart. <laughs> but they want to buy things on old, they want it to feel like it's a vintage store, that they're buying secondhand stuff. Uh, this is called the uh, impulse table, the impulse shelf. And at the cash register, it's important to have things for people to buy at an impulse that are $20 or less. And people go into sort of a manic condition now. Uh, research indicates that when they pull out their credit card, they get a little high and uh, they uh, wanna buy a lot of other things, especially if they're buying something really nice for themselves. They wanna buy things for their children and their spouse so they don't feel guilty. So uh, you put lots of things at the front and center table. You should be able to sell at least one impulse item every time you're having a sale. This is an easy way to sell money. Now the retailer here made a big mistake. The uh, cash register is too cluttered. There should be only merchandise on the front and center table. I mean on the shelf, the shelf itself should be completely empty. 
It looks too cluttered. It'll confuse the shopper. This is the spouse chair, uh, where you want to have a couple of uh, comfortable chairs to get rid of the spouse when they come into the uh, store. Uh, so this is a uh, woman's store where they wanted to get rid of the man. So they put manly things like cameras and manly magazines to read. And it's kind of a grungy chair like it's in your man cave. And the idea is to get the man out of the way as quickly as possible because they tend to rush their spouse to shop. There's a famous lingerie store that found that when the, when the woman was accompanied with a man, she only spent three to four minutes in the store. But when she was with her girlfriend, she spent the 20 to 30 minutes in the store and spent a lot more money. So that store puts, uh, to get the men from going in there, they put in, they've now put large racy posters on their windows that a lot of men don't even want to look at, but they want to stay at least 20 or 30 feet from those posters at any one time. So they'll just say, go into the store, take your time, here's my credit card, and I'll go down to the Sears and get some Craftsman hardware or something. <laughs> uh, it's important for the millennials to look a little grungy. These are new jeans, artificially distressed, but more importantly, displayed on a workbench in a way to look like a vintage store. This is a store we're working with right now that is too cluttered. And one of your jobs as a retailer is to pre-sort for your customer. It's a great store. They have the best lighting I've seen anywhere. These are incandescent bulbs with shades. Incandescent bulbs relax the customer and they soften the fluorescent lights and they give it more of a residential character. Almost all of you should try to have 10, at least 10 incandescent shades. They don't have to be all matched, but the old fashioned incandescent bulbs, I don't even know if they sell them anymore, gives that warm light and it makes people feel more relaxed. Uh, we're seeing a lot of lamps in restaurants where again, they're putting lamps on the restaurant you know, with a warm incandescent bulb and when you do this, people will order the second glass or second bottle of wine and a dessert and an expensive coffee. They stay longer. It's extremely important, especially when you're gonna compete with the internet, that you give a relaxed, warm, incandescent light around your store. These are not very expensive to do and they make a huge difference. It's important if you're in a furniture business or almost any business, to give people the place to relax and to feel comfortable so they can relate to some furniture stores are probably the best at this. This is a classic restaurant. The, the uh, cardinal rule for lighting in restaurants is that restaurants should have three light sources. There should be a light on the ceiling, a wall sconce, and a light on the table. Especially if you're a better restaurant. If you uh, the best light on a table is actually a little lamp with a 20 or 25 foot watt incandescent bulb or a candle. If you have a candle, it should be a real candle that you really light with a match and that you have to replace every night. Uh, the restaurants that put in artificial candles with light bulbs are dumbing themselves down to, uh, to a commodity losing that edge of the experience, just that subtle little thing. Uh, I uh, was in a business today in one of the two districts, I won't say where, where it had a, uh, a very, very strong smell of cheap perfume. They've opened all these air fresheners to make it feel, I don't know, like what, it feels like a, I'm not gonna say it, but it's, it's awful. It made me ill going in the restaurant. and. Uh, really don't want that. You really want it to be comfortable. Um, there's a lot you can do with lighting. All of the town centers now are putting in the string lights across the street. This helps with the place making. I don't know, do you do that here? It's really a simple, it's pretty expensive actually to do because of the safety, but it makes a big difference. Uh, cinemas 
drive restaurant traffic, they don't drive retail rest traffic. The new thing with cinemas is to build them where you can go to a movie and walk to shops and restaurants. The idea now of building a big movie palace and your flight, your center out here, I think has that. The idea where you just go and drive back and forth doesn't work. This is a new Eddie Bauer store designed to look like it was built in 1910. Now we all know it's new. This is a fake upper level, but the idea is they're trying to emulate a historic town. This is uh, probably an over exaggerated storefront, but it's the idea of this is designed so that you can see the merchandise in a second per window. And then they have the magic word sale. Uh, this is the store owner that is sorting the customer. Uh, this is the new thing for uh, body stores where they're merchandising on black shelving and then they're uh, making it uh, a gift that you can pick up and take out of the store. By the way, uh, women will not buy cosmetics on sale. Uh, they don't, don't want to take a chance that it's bad cosmetics. So they will give them promotions. They'll give them a free bag or a free package instead of putting it on sale. This is a restaurant that we were working with in California and she was going out of business and uh, we felt one of the shortcomings was she had blue. The lights were too harsh. They were really bright lights. The chairs were very uncomfortable. It was a bakery. It was uncomfortable to sit there. And uh, this is the front of her store. And she also had an issue where you couldn't really tell that that was her store. Her problem was that she sold coffee and baked goods and Pete's Coffee sold bakery and coffee goods. And she said, all the customers go into Pete and nobody comes into my store. What can I do? So what do you think we told her to do? <laughs> right? It's obvious, right? Um, this is very common, just to see something this simple. And then to make things worse, the city uh, planted a tree right in the front of her door. So when she does get a sign there, it'll block the sign. This is a project that we've been involved in for about a year. Uh, these businesses are underperforming. Uh, in this case, uh, these four businesses were underperforming and uh, they wanted to know why nobody knew these were restaurants. And my job was to tell them why nobody knew these were, these are four restaurants in this picture. So what do you think I told them? Times, right? There's just no indication. And it looks more like a bank to me or, a, or an office than a restaurant. And this was designed by a very famous office architect who does great offices, but he's not a retail architect. Just putting merchandise on a black shelf with well lighting gives a perception that it's higher quality and it's closer to you and it's more approachable. This is a, a clever retailer that pre-sorted her handbags. She has over 400 handbags for sale and every two days she picks out her favorite having to do with a theme and when customers go into their store, she's already pre-sorted out what she likes. And as a store owner, you can do that, but you can go one step further and you can put a little placard saying, uh, you know, this is Michelle's favorite bag or the manager's favorite bags. This is why these are handcrafted by a, somebody and you can give a little story. Um, your advantage is that your store is managed by you, a real person, not somebody on Madison Avenue. And you should all have a picture of yourself in a placard with a nice little paragraph file. I'm John Smith. I opened this store because my grandfather did this and this is my goal. You should boast about yourself. You're the reason why people will buy from you instead of on the internet because they want to know that a real human being that looks reasonable, that they can trust, made a decision that they're buying this quality from this vendor. You have to promote the fact that you're not a national chain. You have to also look like you're not a national chain. And a lot of the retailers I saw here have national chain aluminum storefronts, national chain lighting, 
national chain signage, and you're confusing the shopper. You're looking like a, a chain. Okay, what do you think we told this retailer? Too, too cluttered, <laughs> too overwhelming. And uh, this retailer, this is a classic mistake, would have significantly higher sales with half the merchandise. They should cut this merchandise in half and make it easier to shop. Here's a very simple, very effective storefront uh, by taking the sign and pulling it to the side. This punches out the merchandise and it really makes the store look like it's a handcrafted storefront, not that of a national chain. This is an aluminum storefront center, but they painted the anodized aluminum gray to make it look like wood. It's a very simple thing. This storefront uh, is a very good gourmet shop, but it looks like a it looks like a convenience store that you would see in a gas station. The window is too cluttered and it's working against them. They would do much better with better signage, maybe signage up there in the panel, maybe a signage above. But this is working against them. Here's a really beautiful sign uh, in black. Signs work better when they're in dark, glossy colors. Dark, uh, I was gonna say dark black. Black, dark gray, red, uh, glossy colors work really well, or white. The only color that's really horrible that will backfire is beige or tan or taupe. Stay away from all browns and all taupes. Here's a, a store in an alley, in sort of a rough area. And these doors close at night but in the daytime, they're display props. Very, very simple, very beautiful. And this says, I'm buying, here's the green. I'm really buying from a specialty handcrafted place. And this, they're gonna sell something or they're gonna get service I can't get online. These are the basic rules. This is what we did for, Me we're working in Mexico. This is in meters, but this is the basic, the basic rule. There should be a bulkhead no higher than half a meter. Um, you should have 60% clear glass painted in a dark color. The sign bands should be between 18 inches and two feet. And this says, I am a handcrafted specialty store that sells goods and services you can't get online. Even if you are a national chain, this makes it feel like you're not. Unfortunately, I've seen a lot of store windows here on the south side and the north side with glass, with reflected mirror glass, where you can't see into the storefront. This is very simple. You can retrofit a modern storefront with this just by painting it and with a good carpenter. Here's a modern storefront painted in a smart dark blue with a very simple one second display. And then their sign is just with the awning. Awnings were invented, we think, by the Romans to pull retail uh, shoppers up to the window. We use awnings for a sign band, but to pull people up to the glass because it's human nature to walk under something. You feel safer. So we like awnings. The awnings today, though, that we always use are very smart, very simple, with no side curtain. And they're made out of a uh, material that looks like cotton canvas. They're not glossy plastic. And there are some glossy plastic signs here. They tend not to be striped. That's what our grandparents liked. They tend to be very smart and very contemporary. The downside is that these awnings only last in this climate about two to three years. Mm -hmm. They're hard to clean. But they give the appearance that you are a handcrafted specialty shop of high quality. Here's a very simple, this is all aluminum with wood put in there to make it look like it's a handcrafted uh, wood storefront. Here's a smart modern storefront, clear glass. The awning, these letters are too big. These letters should be no taller than three inches and they should be upper and lowercase. Upper and lowercase is easier to read than all uppercase, even though it's smaller. Here you can see the plant and then the awning with nothing on the side. Urban design, uh, parks bring some traffic. We are putting parks in all of the spaces 
so that it gives somebody an experience and a place to relax. Uh, the streetscapes do not have to be expensive. This is Palm Beach, Worth Avenue, the most expensive shopping street in the country. And its sidewalk is concrete and its landscaping is grass. That's about as basic as you can get with palm trees. <coughs> $2 square foot concrete. It is well designed with handcrafted saw cut joints. And they put the landscaping vertically on the buildings to give that green effect. And their, shop, their downtown development authority power washes the sidewalks every week. So they're spotless. And you can only do that with, a, with a, really a downtown development authority. This is the most expensive shopping street in the country with probably the cheapest streetscape. Flowers uh, are very, very important to distinguish yourself to give that experience. And all of you should have flower boxes in your front window and they should be maintained. And you should budget that they will be vandalized at least once a year, probably once a week in this kind of an urban environment, somebody will pull the flowers out or pour stuff in them. Uh, and your job is to hire somebody or maintain them yourself so that you can tell the public that this is a safe place that people love and care for. Right now, South, uh, the South District doesn't look that way. It is a safe place statistically, I've seen the statistics, but you don't look as safe as you are. Uh, trees increase the price flexibility by 12 to 20 percent. In other words, people will feel comfortable paying 12 to 20 percent more for the merchandise if it has good landscaping. There is a study that shows that people feel anything they buy in a main street is 20 to 30 percent more expensive than they buy in a shopping center. There is a, it's not true, but the perception is that when they come to your store, they're paying 20 to 30 percent more than they would buy in a shopping center or a strip center. Your job is to make it feel like you're not paying more or if you are paying more you're getting good value. This is a mistake. Uh, this is a low shrubby tree, a crepe myrtle, that blocks these storefronts. This hurts the retailer. You should have your trees trimmed high. In the South District they need to be trimmed a lot higher. They're way, way, way too low and the trees should not block the signage. That hurts this store. Here's another example where the tree was planted right in front of the sign, right in front of the store. That's a mistake. The tree should have been planted here. And I'm a landscape architect. When we specify trees, we actually go out and look at the street and say, there's a sign, there's a front door, move the tree here. So it's asymmetrical, but it's located in the right place. The next trends. The next trends are that the mall tenants uh, are having to leave the malls because they're closing, they're losing their department stores, and these mall tenants are running to main streets. And you may or may not want to have a Williams-Sonoma or Anthropology or Patagonia on your main street. That's up, to, up for you guys to work out. Uh, most cities we work with absolutely do not want any national chains on their main street. Uh, in fact, almost every city I've ever worked for makes, uh, makes it very clear that they only want local independent retailers. But you should be aware that the national stores want to locate on main streets that have high design standards, good sign codes that are well maintained, that have downtown development authorities that manage the downtowns like a shopping center. And then if they do go there, they will sign a 10 the 15 year lease and they will invest millions of dollars in the storefront and bring it up to an extremely high standard. This was an abandoned store that had been vandalized in the 50s with aluminum. And they will spend money on the storefronts. They will not go into downtowns if they're the only nice store. And if there's a relaxed sign code, they will avoid the town. But all of these retailers right now are running for cities. Uh, even Apple. Uh, Trader Joe's is not going to most cities. They still like the suburbs, but if it's a strong enough city, they'll go there. 
Um, this is Carmel by the Sea. This is a really great example of a fine historic district. Uh, the historic districts are getting very good. Uh, Nantucket, Charleston, Savannah, Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia. They are now uh, putting in really high standards for storefront design, for awnings and such, and uh, retailers in well-designed, well-managed historic districts tend to have sales of two to four times the national average in a mall. And the retailers are really running for these. What I find, though, is that every city I work in says no to this, that if this gap is here, they feel it'll ruin their city and it'll ruin their life if that's a gap. There's a very strong pushback to that. This is what most cities want. This is what's actually there. This is in Savannah, South Carolina. And a number of cities like Savannah and Charleston's policy is to have stores that people like to shop at in their downtowns. It's a radical idea. They, they want to sell things that people want to buy in the downtown rather than the mall. So uh, Charleston, we've been advising them for years. Charleston's policy is I want Brooks Brothers and uh, Men's Warehouse and Anthropology and Apple in downtown Charleston. So if you live there, you can walk to that store and you don't have to go to a mall. If you do have national chains though, you should require that they be designed to look like handcrafted and you should minimize the size of the signs and such so that they don't spoil the downtown. This is the Banana Republic in Charleston. This is a brand new storefront designed to look like it came out of the Civil War. It's actually designed to look historic. Uh, even Walmart uh, is now going urban. Walmart has realized that much of their growth depends on cities. And so this is in Washington, D.C. This is a four-story Walmart uh, attached to a historic building. So all of the big retailers have urban models. This is the uh, uh, Target in Philadelphia by Rittenhouse Square. They're all going urban. This is uh, one-fourth, less than one-fourth the size of the average Target. So. Uh, if you want to have this type of store, you may or may not want, that's something you have to work on as a policy, but they are reaching out to go to places like downtowns. Uh, this is the classic storefront look. I'm gonna leave you with this. I'm gonna encourage you to give the store a handcrafted look, paint the front, keep it well painted, keep your door clean. Your windows should be washed once a week. Your front door should be washed once a day, at least. That means that you're offering an experience you can't get online. Um, again, I'm offering two months of free consulting for any of you on an online. Send me an email. Please don't call, just send me an email. Send me photos. I will be more than happy to correspond back and forth with you. Give me a few days and uh, there's no charge for it. And as many times as you want to email me, you're welcome to do so. Uh, if you are a Facebook person, go to our Urban Retail Institute Facebook. We post good research every day. I think you'll find it interesting. This is a book I wrote called Urban Retail, where I go through all these principles to help downtowns. And I teach a, a three-day class at Harvard where I bring in the best retailers and the best developers for three days. It's open to the public. and. Um, it's actually, this is wrong, it's actually July 15th class, July 15th to July 17th. Uh, I would encourage you to consider that. And thank you very much. And thank you everybody for coming. Um, if you didn't get a chance to sign in, there is a sign-in sheet. I uh, ask that you please, oh, Missy has it. Please uh, include your email. I will be posting this seminar online. I will also send a link to it um, if you send me your email. Um, again, uh, Bob is here. He has opened himself up. Please take advantage of his expertise. And um, thank you all so much. I appreciate you coming. Thank you. And I'll be walking around for another day, so hopefully I'll see some more of you.